This is a summary of the paper High Dimensional Sparse Embeddings for Collaborative Filtering. This work was done by Bart Hutals and myself at the University of Antwerp. So a lot of modern recommender systems work by representing catalog items as vectors in some space. We call these vectors item embeddings. In a typical recommender system, the dimensionality of the embeddings can be anywhere between 10 and 1000. In this work, we asked the question, can we learn better embeddings by drastically increasing this dimensionality? To answer this question, I will start by giving an overview of some common linear collaborative filtering models. Then I will introduce a recipe for high dimensional sparse embeddings. And finally, I will summarize our experiments and results. The information retrieval task we address here is collaborative filtering with implicit feedback. In this scenario, we have a set of users, a set of items, and a set of user item interactions in the form of a sparse user item matrix. We assume here that the user item matrix is binary. In other words, it is uh, only recorded whether a user has interacted with an item or not. A very simple family of collaborative filtering models is item similarity models. These models compute some kind of item to item similarity, which can then be used to generate recommendations. In the most straightforward case, these recommendations are generated by simply multiplying the user item matrix with the similarity matrix. And the resulting matrix is going to be dense. It contains a non-zero score for every pair of user and item. In some item similarity models, the values of the item similarity matrix are going to be learned through optimization. One such model is SLIM. The SLIM model also regularizes the learning objective in such a way that the resulting similarity matrix is sparse. An obvious benefit of this is that a SLIM model for n items doesn't require us to store n times n weights, which would be very inconvenient. But there are also other ways to keep the number of parameters of a similarity model manageable. For example, we could factorize the item similarity matrix into two sets of item embeddings where the embedding dimension D is a lot smaller than the number of items N. This family of models includes FISM for factored item similarity models. FISM is one of many possible matrix factorization models, but unlike FISM, most of those do not learn just item embeddings, they also learn user embeddings. In this work, however, we will focus on models like FISM. The main advantage of that is that they allow us to make predictions for new unseen users without having to do additional training. So what makes us interested in high dimensional embeddings? When we were looking at the literature on embedding models, we started seeing some kind of trend. For example, in this figure, which is adapted from the FISM paper, we can see that model accuracy goes up as the embedding dimension goes up. This is not extremely surprising, but what we expected to see, at least in some papers, was some kind of optimal embedding size for a given data set. Maybe because of increased regularization that would be required for larger models or because of some intrinsic dimensionality of the data. What happens in reality is that performance kind of just keeps going up. We can see the same thing if we look at figures from other matrix factorization papers, such as this one or this one. And one of the things this suggests is that Perhaps the best performance should be reached by a model with a very high dimensionality, or even a model that does not rely on factorization, such as SLIM. And this turns out to be the case. In 2019, Harold Steck proposed a model called EASE. This is a variant of SLIM, so it's a full rank model, and it has a closed form solution. But despite its simplicity, it was shown to outperform several embedding based recommenders. The ease model in itself doesn't include a sparsity objective, but it turns out that you can still make it sparse. For example, you can just set the smallest weights to zero, and it turns out there will not be much of a difference in performance. This is important if we want to use this model in the real world, because as I just said earlier, we very much want to avoid dealing with n square parameters at serving time. But there's also a downside to pruning. At practical sparsity levels, you can no longer really expect a model to give you a non-zero score for every user item pair. That may not always be a problem, but in some scenarios, it can be an issue. 
For example, many industry scale recommender systems rely on ranking models that rank arbitrary sets of items by their relevance to a given user or context. And that would be difficult if most of your model scores are zero. Embedding models don't have this problem. And so that's how we arrived at the question, can we learn very big, very sparse embeddings? And in particular, can we get the same very good performance as ease, but also still keep all of the benefits that currently make embeddings models uh, attractive? So what we're looking for looks something like this. To make predictions, we multiply the sparse user item matrix by a first sparse item embedding matrix, and then another one. And these two sets of embeddings can be either the same or they can be different. An answer to the question of earlier, of course, is yes, we can learn this kind of embeddings. The method we came up with is quite simple and it involves Cholesky decomposition. Cholesky decomposition takes a symmetric positive definite matrix and decomposes it into a lower triangular matrix and its transpose. So conceptually, similarity matrices are symmetric. And so we find that this decomposition can easily be applied to the kind of matrices learned by models such as SLIM or EASE. The similarity matrix we ended up factorizing is a slightly processed version of the EASE matrix. We also found that just like in the EASE paper, the resulting matrices can be pruned without much of a loss in performance. In fact, we will see that pruning the Cholesky factors has less of an impact on performance than pruning the original ease matrix directly. Here's what that looks like in Python. First, we compute the ease weights. So a major benefit of starting out from the ease weights is that they can be computed analytically. So this can be done in about four lines of Python. Then we process the results a little bit and decompose it, again, just with a few lines of code. Since Cholesky factorization is pretty efficient, uh, the two steps here end up having a similar complexity. Now let's look at some results. We used three common datasets, MovieLens, the Netflix dataset, and the Million Song dataset, and two evaluation metrics that are more or less the standard for implicit feedback collaborative filtering. We evaluated a few different models, including weighted matrix factorization, shown here at the bottom, and a few deep models. The big K you see here is the model rank. So for linear embedding models, this is just the embedding dimension. For deep models, this will be the size of the last hidden layer. For full rank models like Ease and our Cholesky model, there's also small K. This is the number of non-zero weights per item after pruning. Cholesky decomposition is exact, so therefore, the first thing we should expect to see is that if we don't do any pruning, our new models should reach the same performance as ease. And this is exactly what the results here show. We also want to compare it to some embedding based models. And the best model shown here is a variational autoencoder that outperforms ease on MovieLens, but not on the Netflix dataset or the Million Song dataset. If we then look at the more practical pruned versions of ease and of our new model, we see that they both lose a little bit of accuracy, but on the whole, they manage to stay well ahead of the embedding based models on the largest data set. If we zoom in on the difference between ease here on the left and our proposed model on the right, we see that the Cholesky model comes out slightly ahead for a range of different sparsities and regularization levels. We also compared the two models in terms of training time. And what we see is that the overhead due to the Cholesky decomposition is relatively small. And then to conclude, earlier in this presentation, we argued that one of the benefits of using embeddings is that they would allow us to assign non-zero scores for arbitrary items. And here we see that this is the, the case, even after pruning. Predictions for a prune ease model are 90% sparse while predictions for a similarly pruned Cholesky model are 99% dense. And with that, I will wrap up this summary of our main findings. Please check out our paper. It contains results for more experiments and models, including this one here, where we compare Cholesky factorization to singular value decomposition and show that Cholesky factorization is more robust to pruning. Thanks for tuning in.
Don't hesitate to contact us with any questions and we hope you enjoy the conference.